As we step into the second sermon in this series today, I would like to rename Lesson 2, Remember the Past, Improve the Present, is the new title. Allow me to share two more passages of Scripture, one from Exodus 24, 1 through 2, and one from Hebrews 11, 1. From Exodus we hear, Then God said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Aaron and Nadab and Abihu, and the seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship at a distance. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but the others shall not come near, and the people shall not come up with him. From Hebrews, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. All of us know of the plagues and pandemics that have been a part of human history. The worst flu pandemic in world history still remains as the influenza pandemic of 1918 to 1920 known most commonly as the Spanish flu because it was believed to have its origins in Spain. Calling it the worst in human history, E. Thomas Ewing, a history professor at Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, writes, by the time three waves of Spanish flu swept across the globe in 1918 through 1920, at least 50 million people were dead including 675,000 Americans. And he says, by comparison, the flu pandemics in 1957, 1968, and 2009 combined claimed an estimated 225,000 Americans, actually a very large number, and 3 million people worldwide. This flu was believed to have infected 500 million people worldwide one out of every three global citizens. In 1918, they didn't even know it was a virus, Ewing continues. There had been decades of research on microbes, so they understood that it was transferred person to person through respiratory drops by coughing and sneezing, but viruses weren't discovered until the 1930s because they didn't have powerful enough microscopes. Takeaway number one, we didn't know it was a virus in 1918, and therefore there was no testing because no testing existed. Takeaway number two, Spanish flu was also more infectious than COVID-19, caused sy sym symptoms much faster and was far more deadly. And unlike COVID-19, which possesses the greatest risk to the elderly, the Spanish flu targeted the young. It affected everyone, young and old, says Christopher Nichols, an associate professor of history at Oregon State University. But it disproportionately killed the healthiest among us, the all-American 22-year-old football player, the strongest lumberjack. People in their prime were getting struck down very quickly. So the fear that animated people in the fall of 1918 was qualitatively different. The Spanish flu started among the troops who were stateside training and preparing to go to battle in Europe during World War I. The Spanish flu claimed the lives of 45,000 soldiers before they reached the battlefields of Europe in a war in which we lost 53,000 soldiers in battle. So takeaway number three is despite those differences, the parallels between 1918 and 2020 are striking. In both cases, there was no vaccine, there was no treatment for the disease, along with an overriding fear that besieged healthcare systems and that they might crack under the siege. Takeaway four is, in both pandemics, the most effective immediate response was the same, social distancing. Nichols said it was called crowding control back then, but whatever you call it, Limiting contact worked in 1918, and it works today. We have learned several lessons from studying the Spanish flu response. 
in cities which shut down schools and churches and tent revivals and funerals and restaurants and parades and family reunions and lots of other places where there were social gathering, the pandemic was controlled well. In cities that, where this didn't happen, the flu spread quickly and struck hard. We often have comparisons between uh, St. Louis, where they practiced social distancing, and Philadelphia, where they didn't. The number of deaths were astronomically higher in the city of brotherly love, a five to one ratio, including 5,000 people who died two weeks after a parade where 200,000 people were on the streets of Philadelphia welcoming troops back. We also learned some other lessons. Back in 1918 to 1920, people wore face coverings, but they often wore them outside and took them off when they came inside. Yikes, they got this wrong. Now we know that masks are needed in both places to prevent the spread, especially when you find yourself unable to socially distance outside. We now know to avoid indoor gatherings in close quarters. We also know the response to the Spanish flu was slow in developing. President Woodrow Wilson and the federal government wanted to stay focused on the war effort. The nation had its first ever draft for that war. We were gathering troops from all across the nation and sending them to Europe. We were driven by major production in wartime all of which caused a very slow response to the pandemic. There was a mentality of this, that we have to stay focused on the war and driving the economy forward. This flu will just pass. It will be gone by summer. It didn't pass. Ironically, it spread from Fort Riley, Kansas in January 1918 to Queens, New York, because troops infected were moved from Kansas to New York to ship out to Europe. And it stayed around for three massive waves covering three years. Also, there were those who protected against social distancing. There were wearing, they were wearing masks, and they also practiced shutdowns. The protesters claimed that as they were doing these kinds of things, they were claiming individual freedom and taking it away from them and unduly threatening anyone who implemented restrictions in federal, state, or local governments. They were rough. They attacked people publicly as communists, which back in 1918, by the way, was a real threat. If you remember, that's when the communists were taking over this, uh, Russia. Or they called them fascists, and this was done on the streets, in the papers, everywhere. They became violent in their confrontations. In one case, there was a healthcare worker who shot and killed two people on the streets because they refused to wear masks and threatened his life. He was found not guilty for his reaction to their threats. Over the last 102 years, we have learned valuable lessons from the Spanish flu pandemic. Until such time as we have a vaccine, we need to acknowledge and follow five behavioral practices. First, we continually need to socially distance. We have to, in the words of my grandsons, make safe space. Second, without a vaccine, masks and gloves, when called for, are needed inside and outside to prevent the spread of the virus as virulent as COVID-19. Third, we need to avoid indoor gatherings that put us within six feet, originally they thought that, up to 20 feet now, as they talk about it more. And fourth, we need to test, continue testing and contact tracing to effectively trace the movement of the virus. Finally, COVID-19 today, like the Spanish flu in 1918, is not political, it is viral. Therefore, we need to get a grip, we need to get a mask, and we need to move through this together as best we can without a vaccine. And without a vaccine, our main tool for fighting COVID-19 is our behavior. Since we decided to have only virtual worship and encourage you to stay home when we gather by YouTube and Facebook Live each Sunday, 
There has not been one Sunday that has passed when I do not ache to be together with you. I miss you all so much. It really hurts deep inside for me to be apart from you, and I know the rest of us feel that way too. We all miss you all. We love you all. I have also found myself becoming what I best describe as an urban fox, two words which I don't think belong together, two words which I never imagined in my lifetime I would use to describe myself or any other human being. What I mean is, when I have seen you up close, I almost feel this weird sense of needing to withdraw in my response. It's an isolation response. It kicks in. It defies my nature. Instead of embracing, I back off. I can't explain it. It goes through every nerve and fiber within me, but it goes against every nerve and fiber within me too. It runs counter to every molecule in my body to be apart from you, to not embrace, to stay away. My heart says go out and be with people. My head says stay in and get through this and help them to get through it too. Honestly, I am not proud of these bizarre and contradictory feelings. I don't like being an urban fox. I battle with these feelings every single day. They defy my personal and pastoral nature, and yet they have begun to define me in this weird pandemic logic of 2020. I don't like being an urban fox. I look forward to just being Tim again. In the midst of this war against the virus, you are my heroes in this struggle to battle COVID-19. You who are on the front lines, you put on a thin armor called gowns and face masks and sometimes facial shields and you go to work every day. You save lives. You meet the public in supermarkets, stores, banks, hospitals, and in medical settings as medical people, as chaplains, perhaps in schools in the next couple of weeks, Day in and day out, you go out. You serve meals to hungry and homeless neighbors. You take risks to make a difference. You show up and serve others. You are my heroes. Those who are following all the guidelines, those who are masking and distancing and staying out of the public gatherings inside and out, you are also my heroes. You are also saving lives. I love you as you help us flatten the curve so that we can be together again. On Friday, the urban fox stepped inside a hospital for the first time in five months. Now you have to remember, as a pastor, Emily and I are in hospitals all the time, but for five months I have not stepped inside of a hospital. I stepped inside of a hospital as a patient and I got to see firsthand what it looks like to be on the front lines. I was deeply touched by the focus, the nerve, and the courage of each person doing their job to care for me and all the others at the hospital. To tell you that the healthcare field is the front line of heroism in this time is not enough. You inspire me. I pray for you every day. It is my opening prayer in the morning when I rise and my final prayer at night. While in the hospital Friday, I received a message from Laura Baird. She sent me a story of two OSU nursing students who are taking part in clinical trials that might help fight COVID-19. Roommates Ashley Bolt and Katie Campanelli both tested positive for COVID-19. They got through it, and now they are part of trials to beat the disease. They are an amazing testimony to beating this virus. And they seem to be having fun. They're amazing as they move through this. Thank you, Ashley and Katie. And thank you also to Hamish Baird, who is pioneering work right now to get us through this crisis. And to all of you who are making a difference, your actions speak louder than words. 
Thank you to all the frontline heroes on our church staff and among our volunteers who are serving this community and going out to serve our neighbors in need, including Reverend Emily as she goes to the meals at St. John's Church. Thank you, thank you. Some of the lessons we learn in pandemic times are just hard to face. Some feel like history repeating itself. In Exodus 24, God tells everyone who is coming to worship to keep your distance. Moses is allowed closer, but all the others have to stay away. You would think the shared trials and triumphs that they've been through would produce intimacy between God and the people. But no, God says, keep your worship over there, please. Don't come any closer to me. Always at a distance. To be sure, God socially distances for people's own good. It's not like one just runs up and hugs God without expecting to be seriously burned by holiness. But the wisdom of distance doesn't erase the people's desire for nearness and touch and comfort. Not a pillar of fire to watch, but a small flame to keep warm. Not a cloud to follow, but a hand to hold. But God is clear. Keep your distance. We learn from God in Exodus that distance saves lives. We would give anything to be close. But for now, God wants us to stay apart and stay alive. Please know our time will come when we'll be together again. And we will embrace and we will hold on to each other and the urban fox will take off to the country. As we read in Hebrews, God is blessing us with faith in these pandemic times. The author of Hebrews writes, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. We may not see this tiny enemy called coronavirus, COVID-19, but we should not fear the unseen. We should have our faith-filled convictions to guide us every day. After all, we have the convictions of things not seen. We have the conviction of faith in healing, of hope in seasons of despair, of love at all times. We have God's love and our love for one another to sustain us and comfort us. We have faith in science and God to find a vaccine. We have faith in humanity to persevere through the pandemic and we have faith to find a way to come out on the other side of this. We have faith in one another. We have faith and belief that we will be together again. We will embrace again. We will sing and we will dance and we will laugh and we will pray, we will tell bad jokes and we will celebrate together again. Just like the old days. We will find ways to get through this and be separate as we're separate to come back together again. May God keep you strong while we are apart. May God keep you healthy and safe while we are apart. May God hold us together while we are apart. And as we are apart, let us remember the past and like those who are models for us right now, improve the present moment. May God bless and keep you. Amen.